Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Forklift Safety and Compliance, Answering the Tough Questions, sponsored by J.J. Keller. My name is Kevin Drooley. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today will be Travis Roden and Mark Stromey. Travis has been an editor with J.J. Keller since 1997 and specializes in the areas of safety management and auditing. He holds a master's degree in loss prevention and safety administration from Eastern Kentucky University. Mark joined J.J. Keller in 1994 and as an EHS editor works for the works with the OSHA construction and general industry regulations. He is an authorized OSHA outreach construction trainer and serves as lead editor on various J.J. Keller publications. Travis and Mark, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us today to talk about uh, forklift safety and the forklift compliance. Um, forklift safety its definitely seen a renewed focus uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, we now have an annual a National Forklift Safety Day. Uh, there was a revised ANSI lift truck uh, standard a couple years ago, and we have a current regulatory agenda item to actually revise um, the OSHA powered industrial truck standard. So um, that increased focus, I think, is with good reason. Uh, forklifts and other powered industrial trucks certainly continue to be in heavy use throughout a variety of industries. And unfortunately, they continue to be a severe uh, source of injury uh, to workers. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, there are nearly 543,000 forklift and similar uh, powered industrial truck operators in the current workforce. And over a four-year span um, that ended around uh, in 2015, there were an average of 75 powered industrial truck-related fatalities per year and over 54,000 injuries that involve cases with days away from work. And in another uh, series of data from uh, January 1st, 2015 through about that same time period in 2017, Employers made over 800 serious injury reports to Federal OSHA about cases where a forklift or other powered industrial truck was involved in a serious incident. So that means either a worker amputation, a hospitalization, a loss of eye, or in some cases, a fatality. So it's definitely you know, an issue that, um, that we need to focus on, and uh, hopefully today, uh, we'll be able to provide you with some answers to um, some of the questions that you may have based on, you know, the OSHA requirements, uh, as well as just forklift safety in general. So what we're going to cover today, uh, you can see listing of it there on, on the slide. Um, we're certainly going to cover OSHA's powered industrial truck standard, which is 1910-178. Uh, and that is where OSHA gives the safety requirements that address many, many of the hazards and, um, and topics that you see on the slide right now. But the regulations are vague in some cases, and in some cases, uh, they're silent on a particular issue. So with this webcast, we're hoping to provide an overview of the OSHA forklift requirements as well as 
answer those frequently asked questions. So we're going to cover the scope of the standard, you know, what equipment falls under 1910-178. Uh, we'll also look at some training requirements under the standard. That's certainly a big component of a forklift safety uh, program. And we'll talk about inspection and maintenance issues along with uh, utilizing attachments, as well as modificate, making modifications to equipment and uh, a whole lot more. So we have quite a bit to, uh, to discuss today. And I think uh, maybe the best place to start with that is with the scope of OSHA's standard. So we talk about it being you know, the forklift standard or forklift requirements, but it's actually the powered industrial truck standard, which does include forklifts. But it also includes a bunch of other equipment, and then it excludes a bunch of other equipment. So we'll, we'll, we'll answer those questions for you today, hopefully. So the standard has a very, it's an extremely broad scope. Um, it certainly covers the traditional sit-down rider forklift. We all know about that one. Also applies to your stand-up forklifts, as well as to order pickers and powered pallet jacks or pallet trucks. These all fall under the same standard and require training, evaluation, inspection, and so on. So OSHA does not have a separate standard for forklifts, a separate standard for pallet jacks. Um, or order pickers and so on. They all are considered powered industrial truck, and that's where that's, the OSHA standards are written to, to that one, you know, all of them being covered under one. But there's another aspect as well. As you can see on the slide, the ANSI, or American National Standards Institute, B56.1 industry standard, um, going back all the way to 1969, um, had another definition of what would be considered a powered industrial truck, and OSHA adopted that standard when it issued um, its own powered industrial truck standard. So you can kind of take a look at those two, and it sort of gives you kind of a general a general idea of what OSHA considers uh, to be within scope of the standard. A few specific examples um, here are these are all covered under 1910-178. And these, uh, this comes from the preamble to the rule, and again, it's based on that ANSI standard which OSHA adopted. So you can see there, high lift trucks, um, platform trucks, low lift trucks, motorized hand trucks, that's where your pallet jacks come in, uh, single side load, uh, loader riders, high lift orders, so pretty much, you know, most types of material handling equipment that you would consider to be within the forklift um, family it definitely is covered. So take take a look at that list and then in conjunction with the definitions on the prior slide and hopefully if you do have questions about a particular um, piece of equipment uh, that'll that'll help you decide. But the general rule of thumb is if it's powered for horizontal movement and designed to move materials rather than people it's a powered industrial truck for purposes of the OSHA standard. A couple of exceptions to that, but uh, that's the general rule of thumb, and it'll get you by in most cases. Uh, some examples of the major exceptions. I think the, probably the biggest one involves earth-moving equipment, um, such as a front, front end and back backhoe loaders. Those do not fall under the 1910-178 standard and are specifically exempted in the scope. And OSHA has said that even if this equipment has been modified uh, to accept forks, if it was originally designed to be earth moving equipment, it's not covered under the 1910-178 standard. But likewise, we've been told that golf cars are not covered under the standard. Um, and there are quite a few letters of interpretation stating that scissor lifts are not covered under the standard. Um, these are generally with golf cars, generally designed to move people and not material. And then, of course, um, similar with scissor lifts. So um, same thing for hand carts that are not powered. If it's not powered, it's not covered under the standard. Now, depending on you know the equipment and the industry, the equipment may or may not be covered under some separate specific standard. For example, uh, the construction industry standards on some material handling equipment, 
uh, the scaffolding standard in some cases when you're referring to scissor lifts. Uh, otherwise, the general duty clause would apply where there is no uh, specific standard, and that's where OSHA would often reference industry standards as well as the manufacturer's operating instructions. So that's a little bit about um, the scope of the standard. And uh, what we're going to do now, um, we're going to shift into training, actually. And you have a, a poll question on the screen right now. If you could uh, take a look at that, how often does your company conduct refresher training for forklift operators? And um, put your answer in there. Uh, we would appreciate it. And um, that will allow us then to uh, jump on in and start talking about um, you know a lot of the different questions that we get on training who can who can conduct it uh, what topics do you have to train on uh, when does refresher training have to be conducted and um, do experienced operators still require training if they move from one company to another so uh, with that uh, I'll turn it over to Mark to um, really delve into this trainer training issue um, further Mark All right. Hey, thanks a lot uh, for joining us today. So uh, you can take a look at uh, the results of our poll there. And uh, it looks like everybody's spot on, pretty much. So one question um, that we get quite often is, do what about, what about qualifications? What are the qualifications? So OSHA says this, all operator training and evaluation shall be conducted by persons who have the knowledge, training, and experience to train operators and evaluate their competence. The standard doesn't go into any more detail. So really that is confusing, very confusing for employers. So they have to determine, uh, it's up to them to determine and ensure that their trainers or the people that are doing the training meet these general qualifications. There's no requirements for trainers to take certain classes. They don't have to hold any sort of certifications. They don't have to be recertified. We get these questions all the time. Now, with that said, there is a little guidance from OSHA. Uh, they have a compliance directive, and part of that says, an example of a qualified trainer would be a person who, by possession of a recognized degree, certificate, or professional standing, or who by knowledge, training, and experience has demonstrated the ability to train and evaluate power industrial truck operators. So they do give you a little more information, but again, it's somewhat vague. The directive also says it's okay to bring in a trainer from outside the company. You know, a lot of uh, PIT truck manufacturers have reps that will come on site and they will do training, uh, or the train, trainer can be an employee. So they pretty much leave it up to you. The important thing, though, that we get questioned on is what about the trainer? Do they have to operate a forklift as part of their daily job? And they don't. Uh, but he or she does have to have driving experience, hands-on experience. There's a letter of interpretation from 2003 that sheds a little light on what the agency means by experience. And I'll quote from that. It says, in general, the trainer will only have sufficient experience if he has the practical skills and judgment to be able to himself operate the equipment. For example, if the employer uses certain truck attachments and the trainer has never operated a truck with those attachments, the trainer would not have the necessary experience um, on the safe use of those attachments. It goes on to say, however, the standard does not require that operators operate or that trainers operate a PIT regularly um, outside of their uh, training duties as a trainer. Uh, so they don't have to operate the forklift as a daily job, but they do have to know how to operate it, uh, probably have operated it as a uh, part of their daily job at some point to get uh, good at doing it. Now, 
now we have the trainer. So let's look at the training program. First, OSHA says the training must be understandable to the workers being trained. In general, if you give work instructions and other information in a language, say, other than English, or by using a certain vocabulary level, like you speak to an eighth grade training uh, educational experience, um, or when workers can't read, uh, OSHA expects the training to be conducted the same way. So that goes without saying. You train all your employees in a way that they can understand the training. And under a recently issued policy statement, OSHA uh, directed compliance officers to verify the training was provided in a language, vocabulary, and format that workers can understand. So again, all training, uh, this applies to not just forklift training. And of course, all forklift operators must be trained before they can be allowed to operate forklifts. But what makes up the training program? Well, all operators must receive a combination of formal instruction, practical training, and a performance evaluation. You know, this is a very thorough approach to training, and you can be assured that when your forklift operators complete the training, uh, that they'll be able to safely drive in your facility. So, what does OSHA mean by formal instruction? Well, in general, this is classroom training, traditional classroom training, using lecture, discussion, videos, written materials, case studies, that type of thing. We've all sat through that kind of training. Also, uh, interactive computer-based training programs can be used to meet part of the program. And why do we why do we want to do it in a classroom? Be, well, because it's a quiet setting, and it allows the trainees to concentrate on learning new material. This is where you can use the program to introduce the hazards of operating a forklift, OSHA's requirements for forklift operations specifically, how forklifts are used in your facility, the site-specific rules. Uh, the rules of the road, you may say, and how to find and use information on the truck's operating instructions. The best classroom training involves employees in discussions and exercises such as case studies, always very effective, um, because it gets them to think about how they're going to operate the forklift. Trainees, as always, should be encouraged to ask questions, and the trainer should also ask questions of the trainees to keep everybody awake and, and make sure that they understand the material. Now, what about the practical instruction? We have the classroom, but that's only part of it. The only way to become proficient uh, operating a forklift is to drive the truck. Now, this practical portion uh, is so critical to having safe operators, it, it goes without saying. Uh, this part of the training can start with a tour of the truck's features and controls. Uh, the trainer can do some simple demonstrations to show the trainees how to conduct a safety inspection of the truck, how to start it, and how the controls function. And then after this introduction, we're going to let the trainees go ahead and have some hands-on practice. Use the same demonstration and hands-on practice approach as this training progresses. Gradually introduce skills. Uh, for example, have the trainees learn how to maneuver the truck in the workplace uh, before they handle loads. And then, when they're ready, have them evaluate a load's weight and stability, approach and pick up a load, operate that loaded truck, and then go and deposit the load. So those are all key uh, things that have to happen in the practical instruction. So a, a couple of other things that that the training program has to consist of, and this is where I think OSHA actually did something pretty helpful for employers, is that they actually broke down the list of topics that have to be covered during training. And some of this will be covered. You can cover in the classroom training. 
Uh, some of it may be more conducive to your practical demonstration, both of those that, that Mark talked about. Um, and again, they require the combination of the classroom and the practical and then an evaluation that we'll talk about later. But however your approach is, um, you have to include the 13 truck-related topics, the nine workplace-related topics, as well as um, covering the OSHA forklift standard, so the 1910-178 uh, standard. And that's one of those things that, you know, the, the, you're probably not going to cover the OSHA requirements when you're out on the, on the floor doing the demonstrations. That's probably one that's much more conducive to introducing in, in the classroom. But when you get out into, you know, looking at the controls, the different functions of, of the various, um, you know, parts of the forklift, you're probably going to cover most of that more in depth when you get out into out into your demonstration portion. So just a quick look here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just so you have them, uh, the truck-related topics are um, operation instruction, warning, the differences between a truck and an automobile. I think that's a, a pretty good thing for them to have put in there. And, and most of these do make um, quite a bit of sense uh, when, you, when you look at them. Um, you know, you take the differences between a forklift and an automobile. If, if someone's never operated a forklift before, they may come in with the assumption that it steers, you know, just like a like a car would, when in fact it's it's definitely not the case. And I don't think people in a lot of cases realize how heavy uh, forklifts are, much heavier than a car. So there are a lot of things that, um, you know, these these topics do make sense, even though I know there's a lot of them, but they, they give you they give you something to go by and they really do cover, I think, the necessary uh, necessary items that that you need. A couple of other ones, obviously, capacity, stability, uh, inspection, and maintenance are all going to be key. Refueling, recharging, any limitations that there are with the equipment. For example, if it's uh, a stand up unit, perhaps you know maybe it's prohibited that it can't go up uh, up and down ramps. Um, as well as OSHA does include a statement that you cover the op information from the operator's manual um, as well as any precautions that are listed from the manufacturer. So that's one of those things where uh, OSHA kind of allows for, you know, equipment-specific information. Even though they don't provide it in the standard, they require you to cover it from them, pull that out of the manufacturer's instructions. So in a, in a roundabout way, they, they do cover it. So those are the truck-related topics. And uh, then if we look over, OSHA also has a list of what they call workplace-related topics that you have to cover uh, in training. And this will be, for the most part, unique to your facility. Um, you know, you, you'll be able to find some of it in training videos and other materials that you might uh, acquire. But certainly, you know, the things like the type of surfaces that you have in your workplace, where your ramps are located, how steep the ramps are, um, the, the flow, the layout of the plant, you know, where the pedestrian access is, the aisles, all of that stuff is going to be very uh, specific to your, to your uh, facility. So you'll, wanna, you'll definitely want to include all of that in your training uh, when you're doing that initially uh, for new operators. And that, that really kind of wraps up sort of the part for new operators, you know, this is this is the base that you know someone coming in knows nothing about forklifts. You know, that's that's what you you know you have to teach them all of these topics that we've talked about. Now we do get questions about training for newly hired forklift operators who maybe have prior experience. And as we'll discuss shortly, OSHA does allow you to accept previous training, but generally experienced new hires will always need training on the workplace-related uh, topics. So as we said, these are very specific. So somebody coming in from another facility probably maybe hasn't been trained on the specifics of your facility. So bare minimum, you're probably going to need to do that in some evaluation. But we'll, we'll talk about all of that uh, as we get on through this. And I'll turn it back over to Mark to actually start looking at refresher training and some of these other issues.
All right. So, so what about refresher training? You know, we get a lot of questions uh, asking how often is forklift training required annually? No, it isn't. Although I do remember from the poll that we took that it, like half the people listening do annual training, uh, which is a good idea. More training is typically better than not enough training. Um, so OSHA instead requires refresher training to be conducted whenever any of the situations listed on the slide arise. Now this is refresher training. So the operator's been observed to operate the vehicle in an unsafe manner. There's an accident or near miss. Safety issues are uncovered during the performance evaluation, which we'll get to. The operator's assigned to drive a different type of truck. Let's say they're driving uh, a stand-up truck and they're going to operate now a sit-down rider. Well, they're quite different, so in pretty intense training would have to occur in order for them to be allowed to do that. And then uh, a condition in the workplace changes in a manner that could somehow affect the safe operation of the truck. Uh, these are when you have to do refresher training. Only when one of these situations occur, there's no set schedule for that. And as Travis mentioned, you know, you're going to get uh, operators that are coming to work for you at your facility, but they've uh, operated forklifts in the past. So you don't have to waste their time and your time by doing duplicate training if they've already been trained. This applies to new hires as well as, you know, refresher training. But there's almost always truck specific and workplace specific issues that the employee is going to need to know. In your facility, it's different from the last place they were at. For example, let's say an employee um, turned sharply while driving too fast and the load fell from the forks. Now this obviously calls for refresher training. Even though the operator had previous training on steering, stability, load handling, a review of those topics is needed. But OSHA doesn't expect you to cover something unrelated like battery recharging in this refresher training. Target what they did wrong and you know make sure that they understand how to do it the right way. Now, uh, in addition, regardless, uh, like I said, uh, OSHA requires that each employer evaluate the operator prior to allowing them to operate in the workplace. So just because they say they're a good forklift operator, you still have to, to check that out and verify it yourself. Now, the evaluation has to take place at the time of initial training. And an evaluation is required to determine the effectiveness of any of that refresher training. So the load fell off the forks. You have to evaluate them to determine, hey, now they understand how to do it properly. And then an evaluation has to be conducted at least every three years. This means that at least once every three years, every single operator must be observed while they're driving and operating the forklift in the workplace under actual workplace conditions. And the at this point, the operator must be able to answer pertinent questions to demonstrate he or she has the knowledge to operate the forklift safely. So you watch them working, and then you ask them questions to determine uh, their effectiveness at the job. Can they do it? A key point to note here, uh, this must be more than just a written or verbal test. It's got to be observed. Uh, and they have to be doing their specific job. So, and going back to where we started, it's got to be conducted by someone who has the knowledge, training, and experience to evaluate uh, the truck operator's competence. Wallet cards. I see that we've already gotten several questions on this, so it's good that we're covering this. Another, this is another big point of concern from our customers, do operators have to have a wallet card or license? OSHA does not require the employer to issue a license or a wallet card. Now, 
Many employers do, uh, which is fine. OSHA only requires that the employer certify the training has been done. Now this simply means placing a record on file that the training and evaluation was completed along with the operator's name, date of training, date of evaluation, and the names of the persons who performed that training and evaluation. That all has to be on record. Uh, there's no requirement to give operators any documentation, at least not from federal OSHA. We, we do know that the state of Michigan requires forklift operators to carry a permit when they operate forklifts. Federal OSHA doesn't, and we're not aware of any other states that do. All right, it looks like we have a uh, another poll question here. Um, if you would like more information on how um, JJ Keller Training Solutions can help with um, with your online training, um, training record keeping, reporting, auditing, classroom training, um, certainly let us know through this uh, through this poll question, and we'll um, we will be happy to do, uh, to do our best to help you out. And uh, that actually wraps up our section on training as well. Uh, and we do have, I know there's quite a few uh, questions that came in on that topic, and we'll uh, we'll cover some of those at, at the end. But for now, uh, we're going to jump over to inspecting of equipment. Um, you know, obviously, having equipment that's in safe operating condition is is a key part of um, of your forklift program. Uh, if it's not safe, uh, you obviously don't want your workers your workers operating it. So to that end, uh, OSHA does require um, that that the equipment be examined uh, at certain times in order to uh, identify those uh, those potential unsafe conditions. And um, that actually leads us right here. On this slide, so the requirements are actually in 1910-178, paragraph Q7. And it, it says more or less that the equipment must be inspected daily prior to use or after each shift if you use the equipment around the clock. So obviously that's a fairly vague requirement, which is I think is why we get so many questions for additional information. So how do you how do you conduct the inspection? Well, to a large degree, it's it's up to each employer to uh, to determine how they want to approach it. Um, I think a good place to start is with the manufacturer's recommendation. Obviously, each truck is going to have specific features um, and unique inspection needs. But generally speaking, I think most people most employers do it in two parts. First, the operator will do what we call a pre-start visual check. Uh, with with the equipment not running, and then uh, the operator would perform uh, the operational check with the engine running. And I say op operator performing this. Uh, the OSHA standard does not specifically say it has to be the operator. Um, you could have a maintenance person conduct the inspection as well, but it does have to be inspected prior to the shift. Uh, so on the screen right now, you're going to see some general items that are common to most all forklifts. Again, these, these do not come from an OSHA standard, but they're based on recommendations that OSHA has provided in guidance documents. You'd want to check things like fluid levels, look for leaks, cracks, defects, pretty much all parts of the forklift that you can check with the engine off. Um, you give those close, uh, very close scrutiny to tires, uh, fork condition, and really anything that could jeopardize safety. So if you're looking, you know, with the tires, obviously if 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 they're missing large chunks, it can cause uh, the forklift to shift, which can cause the load to shift, which can just uh, trigger a chain of events that's not 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 good. Same thing with forks. If they're not in good condition and they crack or break, clearly uh, you're in danger of uh, of a load failing, which is not something that you want to happen. So some general items that 
Again, common to most forklifts, you're going to have some additional items if you're operating electric powered forklifts. Obviously, you'll have to do some checking of the battery and the cables. Um, LP cast fuel or propane fueled forklifts will have some unique uh, inspection needs as well. You want to check out the cylinder and the connections and make sure you know the holding straps are in place. Um, and I, I just think kind of a side note there, those types of um, inspections may require additional personal protective equipment for the inspection. So, you know, depending on what you're inspecting with, uh, let's say, a forklift battery, um, you know, you may need something, you may need an apron, you may need uh, rubber neoprene gloves, you may need face shield and goggles, you know, if you're going to actually be exposed to the electrolyte, versus if you're just kind of, you know, looking at the cables from a distance, maybe you don't need all that. Same thing with LP gas. If you're actually getting in there checking uh, checking for leaks, you'd want to make sure you're wearing gloves and long sleeves to avoid any kind of freeze burn from the uh, from the propane. But that again, that's going to come with your your PPE hazard assessment and will be based on what the uh, what the person is actually doing and what they're exposed to. So when we move on over to the operational check, um, the engine's running. So you're looking at the items that you see on the screen right now. Um, pretty common, I think. You'll want to make sure that uh, you know the brakes are working, steering, all the controls, forward and reverse. Certainly, uh, your hoist and lowering controls. You want to make sure that's all smooth and no, uh, you know, sudden sudden jerks or kinks or stops. Uh, the horn, lights, backup alarm if it's equipped, and so on. And then we have a note there: other checks per the manufacturer. Um, really can't stress that enough as far as when you're conducting the inspection to uh, definitely check uh, the manufacturer's recommendations. Now, of all the inspection-related questions that we get, this is probably um, the one we get most often. How long do we have to keep our forklift daily inspections or pre-shift inspection sheets? Believe it or not, OSHA does not actually require that the daily inspections even be documented or written. So that means, of course, there are no specific record retention times set if you do decide to document your inspections. Now, obviously, even though not required, using some sort of checklist, either written or electronic, it's a good idea uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it ensures that all of the features that you want to be routinely inspected are inspected. And number two, it provides evidence to an OSHA compliance officer that the vehicles are being inspected as required. Because otherwise, what's going to happen, they're going to come in. If an OSHA inspector comes in, if you don't have any documentation of your record, of your inspections, that just means they're going to go out and talk to your operators and say, hey, uh, have you been trained to, do, to conduct inspections? What do you look for uh, at the start of each shift? And um, what do you do if, there, you know, if there's a defect? How do you take it out of service? That sort of thing. And so they're just going to delve more deeply. So it's more, it's more to your benefit to have um, that documented, and it might stave off some of that uh, digging deeper by OSHA. So when it, uh, we're going to move on to attachments and modifications. I know we've gotten a couple of questions on that already. So um, some of those will be answered in this section as we um, as we go through it, and the other ones we'll hopefully get to at the end. But here we're looking at things like, when do we need manufacturer's approval? What if the manufacturer says no or does not respond at all? And then a very common question, how about uh, personnel platforms, which are considered to be um, an attachment? So the first thing you need to know about attachments or modification, OSHA does require prior manufacturer written approval for any addition or modification that affects the capacity and safe operation. And OSHA has interpreted this very liberally, cover everything from warning lights to, as I said earlier, personnel platforms or man baskets. So if you plan on adding to or modifying your forklifts or powered industrial trucks, you must get the manufacturer's prior written approval and then change the capacity plates and operating instructions accordingly. And that applies for temporary changes like 
you're only going to be using an attachment temporarily, um, you still have to have that done for any time that you use the attachment. The capacity plate has to uh, reflect that. So now, what do you do if the manufacturer says, no, we're not going to approve that, or simply doesn't reply at all, which is also very common? Well, OSHA fortunately has addressed that um, in a letter of interpretation from 1997, which is still valid. Uh, OSHA says that if an employer seeks written approval from the manufacturer for a modification and addition, and the manufacturer says no or does not respond, then OSHA will accept a written approval from a qualified registered professional engineer, and that engineer then uh, would have to perform a, a safety analysis and address any of the safety and or structural issues contained in the manufacturer's negative response or what the manufacturer would typically have done if they didn't respond prior to granting approval. And then, of course, your machine data plates must be changed accordingly. So you have two options there. You can go to the manufacturer. If that doesn't work. You can, um, you can go with a qualified registered professional engineer. All right, Travis, very good information. Um, speaking of attachments, OSHA said that personal platforms uh, are considered attachments and require the employers obtain the manufacturer's prior written approval before adding them. So that's the first thing to consider, whether or not the manufacturer even will allow the platform to be used. And here, of course, we're talking about adding a personal platform to equipment such as a sit-down forklifts forks. We're not talking about equipment designed to lift personnel like order pickers. Uh, once, so once you've determined that it's okay with the manufacturer, they've given you their blessing, then you have to deal with the safety issues of using a personnel platform with a forklift. And there's quite a few. Obviously, fall hazards are a major concern, uh, so workers being lifted must be protected either by guardrails or a personal fall arrest system. In addition, uh, you have to make sure that platform's secured so it doesn't tip or slide off. Uh, in addition, the operator needs to remain at the controls and exercise caution in operation. The OSHA they really don't get into the details of safe operation when using personal platforms, but OSHA's referenced the industry standard known as ANSI ITSTEF B56-1. This, this standard does provide quite a bit of guidance on fall protection and securing personal platforms and procedures for elevating personnel. So that standard, like most standards, are copyrighted. It's copyrighted. Uh, but you can download it for free through the It's Stuff website shown on the slide right now. And then elevating personnel is addressed at section 4.17. Operations. Now, we're going to talk about a couple uh, in particular on orthodox uses of forklifts. I guess I can say that. Uh, as well as the more common speed and pedestrian safety issues. And what about leaving the truck unattended and operating on ramps and inclines and that type of thing? So uh, split forking and bulldozing. In other words, split forking is lifting two pallets using one fork for each. And in the case of bulldozing, it's, it is what it sounds like. You're pushing a load on the floor uh, with a load on the fork. So you're you're pushing a load. Now OSHA and it just th even just thinking about it before I go any further, it doesn't seem like a really good idea for either. But uh, OSHA does say these practices could pose any number of hazards. Uh, they say the forks forklifts aren't designed probably to be used to lift and move loads in that split forking or bulldozing manner. In addition, OSHA requires that employees receive training on any operating instructions, warnings, or precautions listed in the operator's manual. So, if the you know operator or if the forklift truck's manual has warning against 
using these practices at your facility, then of course you're going to have to include that in the training program that you're providing, and that'll just take care of this right off the bat. So, uh, plus OSHA requires that loads be stable and safely arranged, uh, and it's likely again, depending on the equipment and conditions that these two practices uh, would definitely result in unstable loads. Uh, there's that letter of interpretation up there that you can take a look at for more information. All right. A couple of other issues here. Um, speed limits. The OSHA does not have a specific speed limit um, that applies to every situation. They kind of generally address it in um, paragraph N1 by requiring operators uh, to follow authorized plant speed limits. So they basically put the onus on the employer to set the speed limit. Um, and they'll, they'll take a variety of factors into consideration. Uh, and you can see what those are on the screen right now, you know, type of truck, the type of operating surface, you know, what, what, how, how many pedestrians are, are are around the operations. Um, so OSHA looks at a lot of things, and employers should look at these same things as well when they set their um, their speed limits. One thing you could turn to is the ANSI B56.1 standard that we've talked about a couple of different times now. Um, that standard does contain a stopping distance formula that you can use to determine some uh, approximate stopping distances if you know certain variables like the ones you see on the, the screen right there. So you can, you can kind of use that if you want to um, calculate a maximum safe speed. Moving on to ramps and inclines, which is a, a topic that really uh, causes a lot of confusion, uh, understandably, I think. But um, the, the standard itself is pretty vague. But if you look at OSHA's guidance, as well as the ANSI B56.1 standard, you can figure out what OSHA expects. So with a typical sit-down forklift, you'll always point the load up the incline when carrying a load, and that's regardless of the direction of travel. So in other words, going up the incline, operators will drive forward, point the forks upgrade, and use a spotter if the load blocks the view. When going down the incline or ramp, the operator would drive in reverse, uh, of course, turning their head and facing downgrade with the forks pointed upgrade. So that's when there is a load. When traveling without a load, the forks should point downgrade, downhill, regardless of direction of travel. So operators will drive in reverse, going up the incline, and drive forward, going down the incline. And I think that the general reasoning behind most of this has to do with the counterweight that sit-down forklifts have. Um, where, you know, it's, it's very heavy in the back, so if there's no load on the front, um, if you're going uphill with the, with, the, with the forks uphill, you could see where you might encounter a tipping, a tipping issue. So that's the reasoning, I think, behind these, these two expectations. Um, and remember, not every piece of equipment is meant to drive up and down uh, inclines. So especially if you've got anything other than a standard sit-down, make sure to check the manufacturer's recommendations as to whether uh, you should be going up and down ramps with it. All right. Well, uh, before we get to the questions, uh, I just want to say we've covered quite a bit. We appreciate everybody for showing up. Uh, so just to recap, if it moves material other than earth and it's powered, then there's a good chance it falls under 1910.178. And under 1910.178, training is a major issue. Uh, there's a lot to it, including evaluation, practical training, and certification. There are also very strict requirements for inspection and maintenance. So hopefully you came away uh, with some key takeaways, including pre-operational and operations inspection items. In addition, we talked about the importance of getting the manufacturer's approval before making modifications or additions. 
Uh, this can't be stated enough. It affect, if it affects the safe operation or the capacity, then the manufacturer has to sign off on it, or else you have to go through a registered professional engineer. And finally, we, all, we talked about a host of operating conditions, including speed limits, inclines, leaving the equipment unattended. And again, these are more the most common questions that we have received over the years. So hopefully they did answer quite a few of your questions. Uh, and I do see we have some other questions for, you know, that are coming in from our listeners. So we will take some time and address those. Excellent. Great job, Travis and Mark. Thanks for your insights and expertise. Before we do start the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. And with that, we will get to some questions. First one. Do you need an updated label plate if adding or using temporary lifting hook attachments placed on forks? All right, Travis. I'll take that one. Yeah. All right. Um, you definitely do need the updated label plate. Um, OSHA does not differentiate between using a temporary um, lifting hook attachment um, versus something that's a permanent you know change to the forks so if you're using anything that would be considered an attachment or modification which certainly this would be uh, then you do have to uh, well, one thing you have to get the prior manufacturer's approval as we talked about second you would have to update uh, the label the data plate okay um, next one it says I'm a safety director with no hands-on forklift operation experience I'm comfortable providing classroom training but not hands-on training I prefer an operator to provide the hands-on. Am I correct that I should not be providing hands-on training? Travis, I got this one. Yes, you you are correct. Uh, an operator that has the qualifications and experience should be the person to do that. And also, uh, they would be doing the evaluation since you don't really have any forklift operation experience. Is there any regulation on operating a forklift on public roads? All right, Mark, I'll I'll take this one. Um, there's no there's no OSHA regulation as far as whether you can operate a forklift on a on a public highway or road, but it is possible there are city or county uh, regulations. So uh, best advice I would have there is to check with your uh, local law enforcement agency, whoever would be supervising that to see if they allow it or if there's any restrictions such as the person must have you know an actual motor vehicle license or you know if you need certain kinds of uh, reflective uh, tape on the forklift or anything like that so it's not a it's not an OSHA requirement but it certainly could be a, a local highway uh, requirement what requirement does a municipality have in regards to forklift training Okay. Travis, you can um, jump in on this. Let me let me take a stab at it. it it's going to okay. depend if it's if it's a state plan state. Um, certain states, uh, OSHA allows them to run their own. Uh, they're, they're a state plan state, so they're the ones that are doing the inspection and the investigations. Certain states uh, cover municipal employees, and certain states. Do not. Travis, do you want to add to that? Yeah, you, you pretty much um, nailed it. Um, basically, if it's a state planned state, so if it's California, Washington, Oregon, Minnesota, Michigan, any state where the state has authority uh, to run their own ocean program, they're required to cover municipalities. So in those cases, you'd be covered just like a private employer. On the other hand, if you're under federal OSHA jurisdiction, so you're in a state like Wisconsin or Ohio, um, any of the ones that where federal OSHA has jurisdiction, that's about half and half. Uh, public employers, municipalities are actually exempt from the OSHA requirements; they're not covered. So technically, you know, you wouldn't have to do it, but it's a good idea, obviously, from a workers' comp standpoint, 
a lot of different standpoints aside from OSHA compliance that you would want to train, uh, you know, anyone operating a forklift, but it wouldn't necessarily be a requirement from, from OSHA in that case. Next one asks, if we get a new forklift of the same class but from a different manufacturer, do the employees need to be retrained? Um, I'll take this yeah, one. Okay. You want to do it or I, I want it? No, go for it, Mark. Okay. So the only diff – well, keep in mind, are the controls different? Is the capacity different? Um, if it's the same class – Different manufacturers sometimes have controls that operate differently. Uh, I would say definitely that they would have to be retrained. Do they have to be retrained in everything? Uh, it depends. What about uh, the different uh, fueling requirements? Again, if it's the same class, does what is the difference between the, the forklift that you have now and the new forklift? That's what the employee has to be trained on. And again, if it's if it's an operational issue, then they have to be uh, evaluated. They have to be trained on on that. Travis, what do you say? Yeah, that, I think that's pretty much it. Um, if it's anything anything different from their prior training that you know would be a safety issue or, uh, or an operational issue, then you would need to cover it. Uh, remember, we we when Mark covered refresher training. Uh, in, in the middle of our presentation, it talked about doing it in relevant topics. So, you know, if if everything is completely identical, the only difference is it's from a different manufacturer, but it actually controls are the same, the capacity is the same, you know, everything else is the same, you wouldn't have to do any refresher training. But like Mark just said, if, um, you know, let's say it's a, you know, a 10,000 pound capacity versus a 2,000 pound capacity, well, that's a big difference. Um, if the forks go, you know, or extend, you know, much higher uh, than what they've been trained on, and they're going to be doing high, high tiered lifts, that's a big difference. Or if the controls are in a different place um, or something of that nature, then then you would want to conduct training. So the extent of it really does depend on how different the equipment is. Um, next one, we received an order to have a mirror on the forklift, but the manufacturer doesn't build the units with a mirror. Is this required? Um, OSHA does not have a specific requirement that forklifts have mirrors. Um, the, the OSHA requirement is that you look, that the operator looks in the direction of travel. Now, if you wanted to add a mirror, it, it could possibly trigger that requirement about um, prior manufacturer authorization. You know, I'm not sure that that would affect capacity, but it might affect safe operation. Um, so you'd want to look, you know, at how you're, how you're attaching the mirror. Are you actually drilling a hole into the, you know, the body of, of the forklift to attach it? Or is it something that's just going to, you know, suction onto the side of the forklift? Um, you know, then, then you might not necessarily have to uh, get manufacturer's prior approval. But, the ultimate, you know, the kind of the the trigger to all that is OSHA does not require forklifts to have mirrors. If wallet cards are provided to participants, who should sign the wallet cards? I would. Uh, they were not specific on that, but I would say the person that conducted the training could do it. Uh, if the list of trainees was supplied to the safety manager. I would think it would be okay for him to do it. It would all depend on what your company policy is, uh, but the trainer knows for sure that the person was trained because he did it or she did it. So, And at the end of training, that's probably one, when you want to give the card out. So I would just say, hey, you know, you graduated forklift school. Here's your card. Travis, what do you say? Yeah, I pretty much agree. It is up to the it's up to the company as to how they want to handle that. Because remember, OSHA doesn't actually require you to give the employees a card. So uh, pretty much up to up to the employer to make that that decision if they do give the cards. Like Mark said, I would think the logical person would be the the one who did the 
the evaluation or the train and probably the evaluation if it was a different person but um, otherwise safety manager professional probably could do it um, you know whoever Whoever the company designated, you know, just be be prepared for OSHA. Then, you know, when they come in to, um, you know, if they start looking at the cards, to, uh, you know, to um, to go talk to that person if there's any question about about the training. So you'd want it to be someone who was fairly knowledgeable. Okay, well, uh, we we thank you both. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to today's speakers. Once again, we hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen and give us your feedback. And that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Travis Roden, Mark Stromey, everyone at JJ Keller, and all of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day.